everyone. Um, so this is the second episode in our Young Urbanist Abroad series. Uh, my name is Janine. I'm part of the Young Urbanist Steering Committee. I was a planner for seven or eight years in South Africa and I recently moved to the Netherlands um, to do a, a master's course there. Um, I'm actually Zooming you guys from Portugal. <laughs> so I think what, um, for me and for our whole Young Urbanist group is how the whole current situation has allowed us to be able to talk more easily across continents to each other. Um, and I think the idea of this series is just to open up that conversation for different cities. And we have quite a lot of young urbanists living in different cities. And I think it's very interesting to learn from other people's perspectives and experiences. Um, so we have some young urbanists hopping off, I think throughout the meeting, but Craig is already here. Um, I think I will allow the, for Sumia to just introduce our main speaker today and then Craig, once we get into the discussions and people have questions, we can introduce ourselves as we talk. Um, but I think just a few house rules, uh, yeah, just mute yourself and um, if you have any questions, put it in the chat and then later on we will um, bring those up as the discussion goes. But yeah, for now, Sumya, if you want to introduce Rian, and then we can start the presentation. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us today for the second part of the series. Um, before I introduce Rian, let me just, uh, my name is Samia. I'm an architect. I'm based in Cape Town, and I'm a member of the steering committee for Young Urbanists. So um, our Young Urbanists that we've got is really no stranger to Cape Town. He's a used, um, if I can say this politely, also in bar in Claremont. <laughs> um, welcome, Rianne. It's lovely to have you with us. How are you? How's it going? <laughs> um, I'm doing very well. It's, it's a bit rainy and gloomy outside now, and uh, if you hear a loud noise, it, it might just be thunder. Uh, so we're not, we're not somewhere in the, in the low felt, unfortunately, so, but otherwise very good. Thanks. <laughs> Good. Thanks for um, giving us your time and um, going, yeah, spending this time with us um, today. Can I give a little short bio about you and introduce you to everyone formally? Um, yes, please, please go ahead. <laughs> okay. So, um, Rian Lo is an architect and urban designer with extensive local and international experience. He's previously worked for Pete Lowe and Dave Devar in association in Cape Town and then for Bernard Mature Architects in Bintook, Namibia. He has since left the sunny South African skies to move over to London, where he works for um, the, the award-winning practice Levitt Bernstein, um, where he's involved with housing estate regeneration projects across the UA with the sorry, UK, with a particular focus on creating innovative science solutions and consultation strategies with local communities, um, which is, I think, Rian, what you're going to be speaking with us today. Um, so before I hand it over to you, I think the structure of the event will be, as Janine said, we're going to let Rian sort of take us through his presentation. And then after that, if everyone, you can turn your mics and your cameras and everything on, and then we can kind of engage in a discussion and go from there. So over to you, Rian. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Um, before I, I start with the presentation, uh, yeah, like I said, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity and the platform to share some of the things happening in London. Um, I have to admit, it's the easiest thing to decide what to talk about today because there are so many different things happening in London at the moment. And I think if we had to dig into each topic individually, we will definitely sit here for a few hours. So um, I think keep in mind some of the um, elements or things I will discuss will be sort of very high level. And I'm more than willing to discuss this towards uh, during the question and answer session. And if there's any particular documentation that anybody is interested in, you can contact me um, and then I can provide uh, you um, the relevant information as as you want it or need it. So, okay. Uh, 
so can anybody see the the screen that's been shared we can see it okay so so the title of the the talk is called mind the gap how good policy can shape good design and um so i think we just need to add a little bit of context here i think um for those who haven't been to london i mean it's one of the more bigger and more dominant metropolitans uh for a long long time and um you know, London um, is set to grow from 8.9 million today to around 10.8 million by 2041. And while it has had a massive backlog of housing as well, in London they will have to build at least 50,000 new homes annually for the next 20 years, which is quite a scary proposition. But at the same time, that also adds added pressure because one needs to recreate uh, new workspaces. And we're looking at about 46,000. And that also adds added pressure in that you need to provide new medical centers, hospitals, schools, kindergartens, all those kind of things that can uh, support the social infrastructure. So it's not just about building homes per se, it's, it's a much more advanced and, and complex beast as, as we will see. So, while London is a city, it is still divided in boroughs. So boroughs is, uh, as I think in the South African context, referred to uh, more like municipalities. And I think um, one needs to understand that each municipality has its different agenda. I think one of the things that um, we need to understand that some, some areas um, have more historical um, areas, or listed buildings, some have more greater parks and all urban elements that we need to acknowledge. So as you can see, there's quite a lot of boroughs within the, the Greater London Authority. Sorry, uh, sorry, Rian, can I um, quickly just in butt in here? Um, are you moving through the slideshow? Yes, I am. Um, I can only see the first slide at the okay. moment. That's not good. You want me to stop sharing it? Um, I think maybe just um, minimize your, not minimize, just make your screen a bit smaller. There we go. It's moved on to the next slide now. <laughs> thanks. Okay. Okay, thanks. Great. So, um, okay, where were we? Uh, okay. Now, as I mentioned, you can see London has quite a, a number of, of boroughs um, scattered across its, its territory. And, and each borough definitely has its own agenda. So, and, they, and every borough is different in, in terms of density, character, and, and what it needs for, uh, for the future. So, in, I think it's also worth understanding that um, in London, because it's quite an old city, there's a lot of listed buildings and conservation areas that one will have to work with and, and respect at the same time. There's also, during the Industrial Revolution, it's got a fantastic and magnificent public infrastructure, especially railway, but it does also present its challenges and create a series of, of barriers. I mean, some of these infrastructure also is quite outdated. And while some of them are, uh, have been uh, improved over time, I think um, it does sometimes create very interesting urban conditions, especially on the ground. And I think what really changed for London was during the Second World War, during the London Blitz, where the city was bombarded for two to three months, which did a lot of damage, as you can see on this photo uh, of St. Paul's Cathedral. And then, so after the war, um, there was a massive housing shortage. And a lot of this happened in, in the more sort of modernist tradition. And what I really like particularly about this photo is that you can see the sort of historic fine grain that is surrounded by these very big modernist slab blocks. And, and a lot of these were sort of standardized and built very, very quickly. And we sort of, for the last 20 years, you kind of realized like, that 
apart from that, from a maintenance point of view, that some of these blocks will either have to be knocked down or renovated, the, the urban model had to be questioned. You know, it, it led to a lot of antisocial behavior over time. And some of these estates have been abandoned. Um, and I think it's not just a London problem. This, 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 we've, uh, this is a UK problem in general, but I think in London, it's much more evident because there's so many more housing estates. So to move things forward, um, for the last 15 years, uh, the London plan was created. And for, with the new London mayor, Sadiq Khan, he places a lot of emphasis in terms of his vision for what good growth means. And the good growth policies um, is pretty much how to give clear guidance how to take London forward. And he places a lot of emphasis on design. The, the point of the London plan is that it's more an overall spatial development strategy and, and it focuses on specific places within the city and how it connects with the wider Southeast. And to give an idea how the London plan has been um, done sort of on a chapter basis, so you can see on the left, there's, there's a series of elements that they look a little bit into more detail, um, describing policy uh, for all these different elements. So it's really a very thorough um, document. And to accompany that, as I mentioned, that there's been a strong emphasis on good growth by design. So what exactly that means by setting standards is that the emphasis should be on design quality, but it should always be questioned. There should always be inquiries, the work that has been done by practitioners out there. Applying the standards refers to how, uh, how the designs have been proposed and there are several design reviews done by independent professionals and it's trying to make sure that the standards uh, is always in place. Building capacity um, refers more to that you to in order to create good place shaping within the city you require a range of skills and what that means is you probably you need your architects you need your urban designers the landscape architects engineers all these different professionals um, need to come together and work in order to achieve these kind of goals Supporting diversity, this is more to ensure that from a socioeconomic, a demographic and a gender point of view, that it supports diversity and things are more inclusive. And commissioning quality refers more to ensure that best practice of procurement is always applied. And then the last one, championing good growth by design, refers to a series of design advocates that represent of London and the mayor and their role to ensure that the highest level of standards is always applied. So I think in, the, in that context, I think where you can have really good policy, but if you can support it by promoting design led and very good design um, aspects, then we can end up with really good built environments in general. So for the, for the purpose of this um, talk, like I said, there's so many different layers that we can look at, but for the focus is purely gonna be on design and specifically housing. And, and, and to be fair, um, some of the examples that I will show, it's, it's more at the level of estate regeneration. The reason why I'm sharing these, um, these kind of um, projects is that um, it's for the practice I'm working with, that is sort of our bread and butter at the moment. And I, uh, through the last few years, I've, I've really understand um, and have a much better grip on terms of how these things work. So, so like I said, there are, there are many, um, in terms of the policies and the different local plans for each borough, there are many good initiatives and it's very clear what needs to be done. So, so I just wanna highlight a few things here, which I thought was very, very interesting, especially if you come from a South African context, because sometimes these are not things we are aware of it, but I think we sometimes forget about it. And, and, I, and I always thought when I started working here and they mentioned these things, I thought actually that, that's a really good way to approach to design. So the first one is that in order to 
optimize site capacity, it always has to be a design-led approach. That is the starting point. Inclusive design I've uh, alluded to uh, earlier. Form and layout and the creation of street spaces is very important. I think this is um, where there's a strong emphasis and normally this is where especially the role of urban design has come to the fore. And once those sort of setting stones are set uh, in place, then um, the other professionals can start to get involved, like the architects, the landscape architects, engineers, and et cetera, et cetera. There should always be the, uh, you should always try and improve the public realm. And I think this can be in many shapes and forms. Open space and private immunity provision was an interesting one. Um, the reason was that, for example, if you do a residential development, they, for example, have a, a simple rule that for every home, you need at least five square meters of private immunity provision. So it makes it very interesting because, you, and what form can you do this? So there's two ways. You can either give each unit a very nice, generous balcony, or you give them a nice semi-private courtyard and it helps to sort of create a sense of community. So I just thought these were little things that was, were very interesting. And, and on top of that, they always try and encourage that you apply, um, provide play area, play areas for, for kids, but they also divide it into different age groups. So for some reason, yeah, um, they don't like if a 15 year old likes to play in the same park as a three year old. So um, I'm still trying to understand the, the rationale about that, but that, that is how they try and look at it. So. The minimum unit sizes for homes was a very interesting one because I think they're way more generous in the London context. So as you can see, a one bedroom can go up to 50 square meters, two bedrooms 70, and a three bedroom 89 square meters. Depending on the borough, mix and tenure of homes is always um, very important. And in some boroughs, they ask for up to 50% of affordable units. And sometimes you have to do it there's, there's no way around it. So, so it all depends on the borough uh, where, where it is. If it's 50% normally affordable, then the other 50% will be market uh, related, but it can also be helped to make uh, some of the housing schemes more uh, affordable or viable, but at the same time, it helps to create uh, a sense of community and people from different backgrounds and, and incomes um, can live within the same housing complex. And then the last one is parking versus public transport. So it's very simple. The closer you live to public transport, the more likely the city will say, actually, you don't need to provide any parking spaces for cars. If you live further away, it works the opposite. So, and then I just want to touch on something that is also very important to, to look into, which is uh, residential um, residence consultation and the value it brings. So. So part of dealing, especially with estate regeneration, consultation is mandatory. You, it, and it's not something that you can avoid. And while some people might see it as an obstacle, it's actually a really benefit to have because it can really help to inform the design process as it is. And you need to engage with the community. And to put it in very simple terms, um, in July 2018, they brought in a new rule called the ballot pr process. So any development where homes will be demolished, the residents need to decide whether the new design scheme, whether they support it or not. And the only way you're really gonna get that right is if you engage with the community and you get them on board and you sort of educate them and, and take them a bit on a journey. And if, if, you, do, if you do that well, it's a very good chance that will approve the, the plan for, for regeneration. Although this is not a particular way of doing it, this is just something that we like to use with inside our, our current practice. So just to divide it very quickly, we normally have an inception where we speak to, to residents, introduce yourself. You can use other mediums in terms of a digital platform. I mean, some residents don't always feel comfortable to talk to, um, to people in person, but they're much more comfortable to make comments on, on a digital platform. A walkabout is always good to walk around the site 
We always encourage site visits to other developments that have been done because it just makes residents much, um, puts them in a better position to understand the, the design ideas that you will share with them. And then over time, you can do a series of workshops and then and further develop the design proposal up to the point where it leads to an exhibition and a potential ballot where the residents can make the decision. And apart from working with that, I think there are other uh, aspects that also one can see value, you know, like trying to create, um, understand how the different networks work in, in an area and also how you can work with local communities to attract talent. And that way you can strengthen lo local capacities. And eventually when you need to bring your ideas forward, you're probably in a much stronger position to negotiate and ultimately get what not only what you want, but also what the residents and the community would like to get. Another way of also dealing with that and, and this idea of meanwhile users is thinking about how to create new addresses. And while you don't always necessarily apply this to every estate regeneration project, some do need that. And I think this can happen in very in many different forms and shapes and sizes. And it has proved to be a really uh, effective way to not only get residents on board, but to get traction to a particular area and like I say, create a new address. So now I just want to show some example of work. So a majority of these projects um, uh, was done by my, my um, practice. And then I, there's just a few uh, interesting and more eccentric examples that I just wanted to show with everybody. So the first project um, is Eastfields Estate. Um, this is in the southwestern part of London, and as you can see, uh, this is a housing estate, but it looks a little bit more like Fort Knox at the moment. So it's a very inward orientated um, development. And during the consultation, residents were really keen to do a full on demolition of this estate and over phases develop it. Um, and they were ready for change. So. And we thought instead of doing something that is a bit monolithic, we start thinking how, how add different elements to it, you know, in terms of different landscape spaces, different housing typologies and better streets and work with existing trees. And then we decided to sort of flip the whole plan. And as you can see, uh, instead of a very big concrete block, we, we started to look at creating a series of different urban blocks different uh, character areas and then this whole area sort of tied together with a, a green spine in the middle. Part of it was just also trying to show how different design parameters can be established and how everything works together. As you can see, it's about the architecture, it's about the, the creation of streets, how the landscape clips onto it. So everything has been thought together holistically and not just through the different disciplines and just some CGI's in terms of the kind of character that we envisage and how it can look. And you can see, you know, this doesn't feel like roads, it feels more like streets. And also, you know, each of these buildings have a different character. So it's not, it's definitely not monotonous as it is. This is a much smaller scheme called Sutherland Road, which used to be an old industrial site. And initially, um, it was quite a demanding, um, site because there was an element of contamination there and we had to get quite a, a series of numbers and these are all affordable units if i can mention that so it's so i think yeah we try to give a much more harder streetscaping element to to the outside and then the whole thing is sort of orientated around the the main courtyard space and this essentially will be the heart and, and as you can see, once the landscape has settled, you actually create a really, really special place here for the residents. And you can see that although it's very, very green in the distance, it also accommodates parking, but it doesn't feel like a parking area. So it's very little subtle tricks that we can bring into the, um, to make it much better. And, and as I mentioned earlier, it, this, this is awful units so so you can do really good design um, for for that kind of market elspia state uh, is quite one of the older pro uh, projects uh, which is down in southwark 
And, and Southwark used to be, um, I think Tony Blair described it as the most dangerous estate in the UK. And I think based on this photo, I, I think we can understand why it created so many issues potentially. So there were two large, uh, two of these large um, blocks on the site and they decided to, um, to knock it down and go for a much more sort of finer grain model. And despite our large so the new model we've done here is no more than five to six stories and we actually managed to double the density as it is and and i just want to share on the plan at the top is how um, a typical block can work in terms of where affordable units can be and private units so i think each each area has different access points so I, I just wanted to share that with everybody to sort of understand that it's not necessarily that um, it, it's in, entirely separated. It can be integrated um, to this, these ways. And I think the success of the scheme was that high density doesn't always mean you have to build tall buildings. So you can create nice little pocket park spaces where needed and, and also integrate community facilities and give like I say, create a bit of an address for the area. Ocean Estate um, was also, this is more around closer to the London Docklands, was quite a bad estate as well. And what really helped you that there was very innovative um, residence consultant strategies applied here. And I think in general, the outcome of it was really, really good. We managed to create streets that are really downgraded and you can see our wall has been integrated with subtle landscaping. Very clear, strong frontages and also how the facades have been articulated, especially also the entrances and the balconies. Creating semi-private courtyards. And within these courtyards, you can still have little mini back gardens, balconies overlooking the space and also a play area for the kids. So it's a very safe environment for everybody. And then in certain areas, uh, as you can see how um, creating very good landscaping, promoting the idea of biodiversity and how that can add so much more value to uh, not just a, an estate, but also um, uh, a neighborhood in general. And I'd, I want to quickly just show this one as well. This is a much larger development called Aberfeldy. And what was interesting with this site was historically there used to be a canal in the middle of the site. So we tried to make reference to, to that in a way and we had to deal with some stormwater runoff. So instead of piping it, we decided to make it a feature and through very clever landscaping, it has become a very effective space for residents to use. Moving away now for the bit more interesting and a bit more radical examples. Um, I think despite London being a, a much more dense city, there are areas that are quite suburban in nature. And sometimes you find these very uh, uncomfortable and awkward where they allow for parking and garages. And I just wanted to share this example uh, done by Stitch Architects and what they effectively shown how you can within these very narrow sites you can bring in very subtle densities and you can still deal with privacy and overlooking in general and so while it feels like a little village it's still private and um, and communal at, at the same time stone studios by Paula thompson edwards um very well respected firm here as well um, they did a scheme and as you can see, this was part of a much bigger urban design framework. And what they have managed to do is, is looking at sort of a mixed use prototype. So as you can see here, they managed to deal with parking, a basement for cycling, create uh, office space and studio spaces while they have residential areas on top and a private courtyard. So I think it just shows you the art of the possibility. And I think if I'm, Correct. I think this is currently on site. So I'm really looking forward to see how this will look once it is completed. This is a bit more of an odd one out. Um, it's called Caxton Works by Studio Egret West. Um, they always tend to try and uh, sort of uh, 
think a bit, a bit outside the box and reinvent the wheel at times. They, they looked at the residential scheme, but what they introduced was uh, bringing some light industrial use on the ground floor level. Um, as there was a particular demand and there were a lot of light industrial units in this particular neighborhood. And, um, and you might ask, but why, light, how, why do you combine light industrial with residential? The thing is nowadays, uh, when the past light industrial used to be part of the traditional city, and then during the um, after the war, it, it moved to more exclusive industrial estates and areas. But now it can come back because technology is so much better. It's so much more greener and so much more safer. So we can actually bring another form, an element of employment into the city. So as you can see, they definitely had a bit of fun here in terms of how they introduce all these different little industrial units on the ground floor and then i would like to share the last example and i and i think this this is a scheme that was recently done by our company and it was uh, it's called hazelers court court and it's it's a um, it's a residential scheme for elderly care and i think you know there's so many so much talk about housing and how we need to do with it and i think sometimes we forget about the our senior citizens and our elderly people how can we help them and create better environments for them and i think everybody now can really relate and understand what they go through on a daily basis especially now that we've gone through COVID 19 where we have to spend a lot of time staying at home and i think it affects us mentally and in different ways so this scheme where I think the strength lied is that they created sort of a central courtyard space and they put all the circulation areas around the periphery of the courtyard space. But what they try to do differently is um, at the scale of, of a unit is that they create very generous units, but at the same time, they try to use the circulation zones as meeting points, hangout spaces, allow for little planters where people can sort of create their own little frontages and and create little hobbies and and i think for me the strength of this scheme was just this idea of creating comfort and and dignity you know they're a very very vulnerable group and i think we sometimes tend to forget about them and so just to conclude um so how does this relate to the south african context well i think i just want to start and say you know like i, th I think we should be careful if we compare a city like London to South African cities. I think it's it's very, very different in many ways. So I don't think necessarily everything that has been done here will necessarily work in South Africa, but I think there's so much room for improvement, how we can try and create better design. I think we all agree we definitely need to densify our cities. You know, there's definitely more positives than negatives in that regard. And I think in the case of London, you know, good policy can inform good design. I don't think London is necessarily the only city where they have proven this. They do very good work in cities like Vienna. I think it's very interesting what they do in cities like Copenhagen. Uh, I would even go far as cities as Melbourne and Sydney. And if we want to go to Latin America, what they did in Curitiba and, and Medellin, you know, like these are really big success stories, you know, so. I think we also need, I think we will all agree that good design will always create value and places. And I think part of our big struggle in, in South Africa, is, I think especially among the public, is this dilemma between houses and housing. And the reason why I say this is that I think we have this notion that people see housing as a negative, you know, houses is more related to sort of the good life, the proper life. But hopefully over time, I, I think that should change. It's, it's, it's not gonna be easy, but it can be done. And I think that's part of where the good design coming. If we design it properly, if we design it well, it will create value and it will create fantastic places for people where they would like to be. I think things we can do in the meantime, you know, like incremental changes, you know, in terms of design. Um, um, to give, I think we can, we sometimes see how a residential housing developments um, and put a big blank wall 
um, on the street uh, edge, you know. And I think little things like that, we just need, you can't do it. security, but it doesn't help with surveillance. So, I mean, there are many examples that we can talk about, but I'm just aware of time here, so. And then I think the last thing I just want to say is that I think we have very few examples of good design in South African cities, but the more we build, the more the public will build believe and support design ideas i think if something hasn't been done before it's there's always going to be resistance and i think we've got fantastic talented places in the right place uh, uh, talented people great big to bottom there are many talented people around in south africa clever designers so many people that can make and want to make a big difference so we just need to start doing it and i think we can hopefully in the future see a radical change and and, and, and change in mindset so Thank you very much. Lovely. Thanks, Rian. Thanks for that presentation. I, yeah, I, your last sort of point is really poignant that um, if we build and do more, then I think it'll allow people to see the value in good design and what good urbanism can be. Um, and yeah, thank you for those examples. They were great. I think it was quite nice to see a range of projects. So, you know, and looking at buildings that we might not necessarily associate as affordable housing and then seeing what that could lead into in, in the old age housing as well. Um, so I think we let's open the discussion. Um, if anyone has further questions, I see that we've already got some in the chats. Um, that's great. We got quite an interesting question, um, Rian which is kept for you um, in the RSVP forms that we'd sent out. It was from Sunir Govan, who I think is with us today. Hi, Sunir. Um, I'm going to go ahead and ask this and then we can, yeah, let's start off the discussion with this. So Sunir's question is, how has statutory policy in the UK assisted with the integration of the so-called affordable housing and social housing sectors in the more affluent areas of central London? Um, and then are inclusionary housing policies in place and how has this impacted the node as well as the market's acceptance of these policies? Uh, thank you for your question, uh, Sonia. You, uh, you're definitely not making it easy for me. Uh, <laughs> I'll, 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 uh, I'll try and answer it as, as best as I can. Um, okay. Um, I think I'll try and put it simple. Is that, you know, you mentioned earlier about the amount of affordable units that need to be uh, provided. And, and it's something that, that needs to be done. You know, I, I think developers, sorry, let me put it this way. A lot of these, um, when they do these um, housing developments, uh, there's always a developer on, on board, you know, because they help with the funding and et cetera and stuff. So obviously the things like the affordable housing um, it's, it's part of the criteria, you know, so, and, and it's something you're not, can't, you, you can't um, avoid it. And by adding that, you sometimes, they have these scenarios that in, in order to make a scheme viable, you sometimes, you might be a little bit short of money. And this is where the Greater London Authority do help out in terms of funding. And that can sometimes be the difference whether a scheme is affordable or not. So, if a developer is short of money, then there are these different channels. But unfortunately, it's a bit of a tick box exercise. So in a weird way, the developer gets what he wants or they want. And then at the same time, the city gets what they want. And then residents also can get what they want. So I probably not answer your question properly. But um, yeah, it's, it's, I think for now, that's, that's the best uh, way to answer it. Thanks, um, thanks, Ryan. Um, yeah, I think it is, it's an extremely tough question to answer. Um, sorry for buzzing it to you. Um, yeah, uh, you also answered a follow-up question I had just in terms of what sort of incentives do, do local municipalities or councils provide to developers. Um, but sure, it makes sense. Um, developers lack funding. Um, incentives or subsidies allow that uh, development to go ahead and at the same time meeting a uh, yeah. Um, the requirements of the city. Yeah. Okay. I, th I think you also need to understand that land values are incredibly expensive in, mm -hmm. in London. So in central London, um, you, uh, there are some housing schemes that are monstrous. You know, it's like, it's, it's so out of scale, but sometimes they hit to, need to hit a certain number. 
the examples I've shown is sort of more, much more human scale. And, it, you know, it's like, I feel it's better examples. So they are, they're not, I think it all depends on which part of London you, you are going to develop. And because the land value is so high, I think sometimes they do need to rely on, on the city to help with financial um, assistance in, in, in general. So I'm like, I mean, as you can see, I'm, I'm more from a, a design background, you know, so I, <laughs> I'm not a developer by heart. Well, not yet. So let's see. <laughs> uh, sure, sure, sure. Um, and then just, just the second part of the question is just how, what's market's perception um, on inclusionary housing in, in sort of, um, you, you mentioned that there's a lot of uh, market participation in on the um, polling system, the the ballot system that you had. So so what what's their sort of take on because because I know in South Africa it's it's initially when um, there were a couple of articles that came out, I think it was last year or the year before, where um in the city of Johannesburg they needed to have a certain I think it was up to twenty percent of inclusionary housing in new developments and, and that was just um, it, it was just frowned upon completely by, well, mostly developers, because, you know, it makes projects less feasible. Um, the incentives that um, councils offered for that just weren't worth it. Um, but the general perception of having my nice apartment next to, you know, a affordable or, or lower LSM um, unit, sharing into the same I mean, amenities in, in the building, but paying a smaller levy, paying a smaller price for, for the actual unit um, was, you know, just not looked at nicely. I, I think London is quite interesting because this is something that has been going, been going on for for quite a while. So it's not frowned upon anymore. And um, and and in some cases, I think with some some estates on horrific conditions. So if you mention we want to regenerate, some residents will say, "Great, when can we start?" And for them, it's more this idea that, you know, I can get a, a much more better house. It will probably be bigger, you know, like it will improve my livelihood. You know, um, there's a safe uh, place for my kids to go, go and play, you know. At, I think there's people um, sort of look at it uh, in, in that way, you know, like. Um, I think where it becomes a, a bit interesting is that traditionally in some areas which um, might have some minority um, communities and, and areas that have been always been much more affordable, cheaper and rent. And I think those areas sometimes kick back a little bit more with the idea of regeneration, you know. Uh, um, I think they, I mean, uh, everybody talks about all these kind of things. What helps in London as well, it's a very diverse city. You know, it's one of the most diverse cities. And I think people, um, like that in in many regards i think that's one of the great things about living in london and i think people embrace it so and, and i think in that regard it does help with um promoting sort of these different communities with different backgrounds and different mix i also need to point out for example that um, when they do these developments is that for example if you do a series of different unit types you know whether it's market related or affordable that the finishing of the affordable units need to be exactly the, the same as um, as the, the you know or the upmarket units, so you can't you can't do give them a cheaper tap or uh, door frame or uh, you know cheaper paint or, or all those kind of things. They need to be exactly the same, and I think that those are little things that help a bit to feel like you know trying to uplift people's lives in general. But and and so and just to finish, that's that's why I say if we do more examples, I think people will believe it can it can work. But there's not enough of those around, so I think people don't like change. I think that's just human nature. Well, thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Samia. Thanks, Anir. <laughs> um, we, Janine, I'm not sure. Do you want to? Um, we posted a few links and questions in the chat already. Yes, um, I think maybe related to the discussion that you guys just had now. Um, my first question was around policies 
Um, it seems like the UK is very much driven by public policies that encourage private developers to kind of achieve the public goals in a way. Or is there any like public projects that actually also take place or are most of these things, you know, housing and things just driven by private developers. And then I think based on that, I also have a question around this new policy that I saw um, where due to COVID, the, there came a new policy that said like, it will become easier for developers basically to convert warehouses and shops and offices into housing. But now there's quite a lot of issues around that because people are saying, you know, the standards aren't well enough. So it will become these unlivable apartments and yeah, maybe they're trying to jippo something. So yeah, I, ha I have just questions around that. Okay. Um, I think you need to understand, um, I think the UK is very capitalist orientated and I, and in the 80s, you know, when Margaret Thatcher came, came into power. Uh, and I think the majority, especially of housing development, is always dominated. We call it like the big five of, of you know, so um, I, I can't remember all their names, you know, but they tend to, to, to dominate the scene. However, I do think some of the, they are much more smaller developers. Um, I, th I think especially like the example of the elderly care, you know, like although it's a private company, they do work with a lot of local authorities and NGOs and all these kind of things. So there is, there's always that element of the private involved. But I think some organizations want to create more value and other, you know, like the big developers tend to what they want to sort of just make sure they tick all the boxes and, and they make some, some money. We're going to change of the, the rules. So it's almost a bit like uh, you can convert whatever you've got. Uh, there has been a little bit of a kickback on, on this side. And, and, and I think what's happened in the past is that what people have done, they convert. I think there was a very controversial story about an office block that was converted into residential units and a one bedroom unit was 14 square meters and it didn't even have a window. And um, they tried to create a big petition to send to, to government to, to fight these kind of developments. But obviously the, the numbers were not there and it's quite ironic now. It's almost trying to promote something similar along those those lines. Um, I think we will have to see how that will turn out, but I wouldn't be surprised if, if that doesn't happen. But I think um, it will cause more damage than good. I, I personally think it's just a way to kickstart the economy um, uh, rather than trying to create proper um, sort of dignified envi built environments and to help with a housing shortage. I don't think that's the main purpose of it. Yeah, I agree. I think it's almost like it's it's something that had a good intention, but if it's not yeah, executed correctly, it actually has more damage than good. But yeah, thanks, Rianne. Um, shall we move on to the next few questions? So I think Sean Dayton posted quite an interesting one in the chat. Sean, are you still with us? Would you like to maybe just, yeah, <laughs> take us through it? Thanks, Samia. Um, yeah, my question is, and I'd like to sort of extend it a bit more broadly and, and maybe bring in um, some of the others, uh, some of the other UK guys that we, uh, that we have. Um, um, so obviously in South Africa, we have really, um, we have cities characterized by very sort of low dense um, uh, kind of form. And um, there's always a lot of kickback from residents when um, developers are trying to implement infill um, and to try and uh, you know build blocks of flats and that sort of thing to try and increase the density uh, close to um, places that uh, have economic opportunities. So, for example, in the city bowl of um, of Cape Town, um, and I think a lot of um, a lot of the residents' kickback is actually justified even though there's a lot of um sort of from our sort of community uh we so we will label those those responses as nimby uh responses um but i really do feel like um your design is is crucial and um especially if you know you've got these you, you're trying to to design your developments in a way that um 
that can sort of stick to the, the character of those neighborhoods, which might oriented um, neighborhoods. And um, just this, you know, all these international studies that have been car carried out recently, which show that in higher density um, cities, your level of, um, of um, uh, sort of, uh, I suppose your f fertility rate drops and your, um, you have fewer children and, and it just doesn't seem like high density or very high density um, sort of typologies really work with, um, with the needs of, of families who are, who are just starting out and have, and have kids um, because of this need for, for some kind of a private outdoor space. And, and, and um, that's why I thought what Rian had showed, the one development where people have in higher density or in, in, even in these, these blocks of flats, they still have access to um, to some kind of a ground floor garden type of thing where, where, where their kids can, can go and play safely. Um, so I was just wondering from a, from a design point of view, um, you know, there, there was at one stage in, in the UK's uh, housing rollout, there was, you know, it was heavily characterized by kind of skinny uh, terraced houses where, you know, it would be like a two story or a, or a very skinny three story house uh, with an internal um staircase and 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 all of those houses um you know you would own that everything from the ground to the sky and you would have access to your to your um to your garden out front and your kids could play could play out front is that sort of terraced housing typology still in in mode uh, in fashion in in the uk or or is the sort of the three-story two-story kind of um sort of mid-level mid-density type of um um, development um, sort of is that out out the window now, and, and people are are people m moving more towards uh, apartments where nobody above the ground floor has access to to um, to a private garden anymore. That's just a question. Um, it sounds like you've you've uh, spent a bit of time here at some stage because the way you described it was it seems very very accurate. Um, yeah, thanks for your question. Um, I don't think they will necessarily call it terrace house. They call it now sort of the more developer term is uh, townhouses. Um, and there's definitely still a, a place for that. Um, we still deal with developments uh, personally where we promote those kind of models. Uh, it tends to be um, three stories high or no more than, than, than three stories high. And um, I think it all depends what really drives that, it depends on the area where you develop. If land values are high, people want to increase density and height, you know, and then obviously houses won't necessarily work that that well. But I'm I'm still a big fan of the, I'm, I won't say I'm a classicist, but I, I like the old stuff because I think a lot of it works quite well, you know, and I think that the UK Terrace House was, of its time, it was brilliant. And, um, I always say that it must work very well because if guys like uh, Richard Rogers and Norman Foster and these guys live in terrace houses, then surely it, they, as, as world-famous architects, they must think it must still be good. So it, they, they still use it. Sometimes what they do is um, they also do uh, houses where it's like a two-story flat. And then on top of that is another two-story flat. So it's like a, a, a mesonet, as we as we call it. So it's like a four-story structure. So the one at the ground floor will have access to the back garden, but the one on top won't necessarily have, but they might have a big roof terrace that they can use. So they've looked at ways to increase density, but it's sort of a bit more of a modern typology. Um, and so you still deal with um, providing the same amount of areas. You still deal with uh, privacy and overlooking um, so a lot of that is also happening here. So, so I don't think it, it's a model that will go. I think it will probably stay around for for a while, because, purely because of the historical reference to it and the success of it. Yeah, I'd love to see more of that in South Africa um, because it just seems like there's this disconnect between houses that are single story max compared to big blocks of flats and no one really knows in South Africa how to marry those two yet in a way that, um, you know, residents are comfortable with and it doesn't seem like a huge um, departure from, from what people are, are, 
are used to, I guess. Um, right. there, can we maybe bring in uh, some of the other comments from from uh, maybe some outside of uh, outside of London, because um, I know obviously London's got its own very particular um, sort of uh, requirements of, of you know because of the land, the high land values. Um, I don't know if Craig has any experience um, from where he is. Hang on, Craig. We're gonna Craig, have to thank you. Have to mute and unmute. No, we've gone to your... no technical issues. Well, while while sorts so while he sorts it out, um, just to answer your question, there are fantastic examples of this, um, and you do find it in especially in places like Cambridge. They're doing some fantastic developments uh, in there. Um, and I think one of the best schemes that has been done, especially based on the kind of sort of traditional terrace house, but in a much more modern interpretation was, uh, it's called Accordia. Um, a different uh, firms, but uh, it won numerous awards and it's a very dense development and it doesn't go higher than uh, I think three or four stories. Um, so they're very good examples. They're very good examples uh, outside in places like Manchester. And, and, and um, so I, I think while you might not find so many of those in London nowadays because of the high land value, there's definitely, there are very um, good examples um, outside of London definitely to explore. I mean, I would, I would love to, I can share all, um, some of these examples with you afterwards if you're interested. Please, thanks, man. that'd be great. Yeah, that would be lovely, Ryan. Um, Craig, are you Craig. Oh, still having technical issues? <laughs> All right. It says that I'm unmuted. Can you not? Oh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I'm not Craig. sure what that was about, but anyway. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, thanks, Ryan. Really interesting presentation. Um, yeah, really enjoyed hearing about the, yeah, your experiences in the private sector in London and doing sort of housing estate regeneration sounds really fantastic work to be involved in. So I, I work in a local planning authority out in the southwest of England um, called Torbay. So it's much like I was saying to Sean Dayton just now, it's a bit like working in Neisner, for example. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's um, the total population is I think 165,000 people. Uh, it's three main towns. It, it's a bit like if you think, if you know Cape Town, it's like uh, Musenberg, Fishhook, and Simon's Town. So sort of three towns along, along a bay. Um, and just thinking in terms of the main sorts of housing delivery that we see a lot of, and I think it's probably similar to a lot of um, parts of the UK, maybe outside of London potentially. But um, yeah, so Rian mentioned that there's sort of a few house builders that tend to dominate the market. Um, so like your Cavana homes and Bloor homes. And what you see a lot of from them is sort of three or four, you know, four bedroom detached houses, double story. Um, so, you know, slightly on the, on a little bit suburban sprawlish. Um, and, you know, I, I think that it, they build it because they know that they can sell it. Um, so an, a challenge that I think or that I perceive is that, so something that's, potentially quite good in the UK is that the national government puts requirements on housing delivery in terms of numbers for each local authority. So, um, so in Torbay, we have to try and build um, 600 or so homes a year, which doesn't sound like all that many, but I mean, it's a relatively smaller um, authority as well. So, and then what you have to do in your local plan, which is like your municipal SDF to, um, designate land for housing development for the next five years. So you'll calculate, you know, how many houses you need to build in that five year time frame, and you need to set aside parcels of lands on which to build those houses, um, which is great because it forces local authorities to look to approve new housing developments. Um, but the challenge is that I think it potentially promotes suburban sprawl. Um, and it, it you know, if you look at the Cape Town example, um, what the planners were trying to do was to, you know, hold quite a firm urban edge um, and, and in a way to try to sort of force 
um, increasing density and residential density by effectively constraining the supply of greenfield land, um, which was always, you know, challenged by uh, sort of uh, things getting resident or housing developments outside the urban edge being approved on appeal and so on. But, um, so the challenge here is obviously because local authorities have to try and hit delivery targets, um, inevitably there tends to be in your local plan a supply of parcels of greenfield land for development, which is naturally much cheaper for property developers to develop um, rather than brownfield redevelopment, which is the ideal way you'd, you'd see higher densities, you'd see more uh, traditional row houses and that sort of thing. So my impression is that although it's great that the, the national policies are helping promote housing delivery, in a way it's, it's doing it in a way that encourages your sort of housing developments on the edge of town, detached houses, um, which, you know, people use the term anywhere architecture, where it's kind of, you can go to any town in the UK and you'll see the same sorts of housing developments on the edge of town. So that's, it's a, it's a challenge that I think is um, regrettably sort of diminishing the opportunity for local authorities to hold more of an urban edge and try and promote the types of projects that Rian was showing us, which would look really great. Um, so yeah. Uh, just to add um, to what Craig was saying, um, some of these developments he was referring to, I mean, we sometimes quite critical if we see some suburban developments in South Africa. And I'm, I want to say some of these developments he's referring to is pretty much just as bad, if even not worse, because they sometimes use a lot of sort of uh, these like bordered in a Georgian or a Victorian Edwardian kind of style. So there's an element of kitchenness. But at the same time, that's what sells and that's what some people like. So. Great. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Greg. Appreciate it. Um, I think we are kind of discussion. Um, if there are no sort of burning last questions, I think I have one for you, Ryan, that I've been meaning to ask you. Um, so I don't know, yeah, if anyone has any last questions, post them in the chat. Uh, we can also always continue this discussion over our Facebook page, but um, if we can sort of st start to wrap up and conclude, I wanted to ask you about the public participation process. So you showed that one slide, which shows these sort of series of actions that have to be taken and a series of workshops that have to be done before you get to the ballot stage, which when you have the election. Um, yeah, the election. Um, what are some of the opportunities regarding this public participation process, which you feel are successful and have worked in the UK that could maybe be implemented or used to strengthen our public facilitation process here in South Africa. Um, and then through that public facilitation process, is there is there a space where uh, like you as a built environment professional, like an architect and urban designer can kind of engage with community members and sort of, you know, tell them that yes, security doesn't necessarily mean high walls and gated complexes. Um, can you kind of start to break down different ways of thinking? Um, that's, I see you're leaving the most difficult question for last. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah. no, um, okay. I, okay I'll, I'll try my best to answer this. So um, let's, let's, um, I think especially with estate regeneration that it, I won't say it makes um, consultation um, easier, but you are dealing with a community, you are dealing with residents. Um, and, I, and I think um, if you are going to change somebody's environment or you're gonna provide them new homes, um, I think it is something that you need to do right and proper um, from, from day one. And you, you need to do it very, very subtly. And, people are not always going to be on board with things. Um, but like I said before, because there are so many examples of other estate regeneration in London, it's always to good to take residents on board and say, well, look, this is more the scale. This is the kind of houses we would like to do. This is the kind of front gardens, the play areas, all these kind of things we would like to do. And the moment when they see that in reality, it makes it so much easier 
for them when you take the consultation forward. And normally what you do is you do a series of workshops. So you might cover one thing. So you discuss maybe you, you talk about community facilities or open spaces or you talk about homes. You know, homes is always the interesting one to talk about because obviously it's much more personal. When you deal, for example, I mean, I haven't personally done it in the UK, but we've we consent to regeneration, then it becomes a bit of a different ball game. Um, and this is where sometimes uh, you get people that are very open-minded. And I think this is where sometimes people, uh, you know, they have their own uh, personal agendas. And I, I think I've heard stories of this sometimes with community consultation, especially I think in, in the South African context where people, you know, they would complain about uh, the neighbor's dog that uh, mm -hmm. comes to park and, and, and on all these kind of things. I think it's like it's like a, on my final slide. I think it can work in South Africa, but it, we need to build more. We need to refer to more examples and and how to, you know like and, and try to convince people through through that way. I I don't blame people for kicking up a fuss if they're not happy about something and well i don't know so much detail about it but for me the interesting thing and i would love to follow it with a very close eye is to see the impact especially in cape town how the conradi hospital site is going to evolve and the reason why i say that i think a lot of the things i touched about the idea of affordable units the city um giving financial aid and and all those kind of things. I mean, I know neighbor, neighborhoods uh, like in Pylons and Thornton, they had a lot to say. They don't believe it and all these kind of things. And I really hope that can be a design that is dealt with very, very well, because if it's a huge success, I think it can make things um, so, so much easier. You know, like, I think we've got to be realistic as well. You know, if you talk about how do you convince somebody not to put a blank wall in front of their house and stuff. I mean, we, um, surveillance and safety and and you know you get crime all these kind of things it is a reality um at the moment so and and i think it, it will always take time to to change people's uh mindsets in in that regard you know so i think i think consultation still has a long way to to go in south africa to be very very effectively and i think the, the great thing about consultation in London is that you can deal with many people. The numbers are there. And I think mm -hmm. you get so many inputs. If you're going to do consultation in suburban areas, you might not necessarily get the kind of feedback what you want, but London is diverse. There's different communities, you know, it's, it, and it's amazing what, what people tell you. Um, there's so many things as designers, we're not, not aware about. So, um, I really do see the value, but I think it will take a while before we can do that in Cape Town. But I don't think we should say it doesn't work. I think I think there will be a time where we can definitely do it. And, and and like I mentioned before, you know, like I know there's some of these affordable housing schemes that the city wants. Student residents uh, don't feel comfortable with it. So, um, and they do say people have been engaged and they've been consulted, but we don't really know the details of, of what how was it done how um you know like i say you know we we do it sort of incrementally in different stages and and maybe that is the key you you kind of need to ease people into it you can't just go with a big um sort of solution you know we we tend when we do start a consultation we don't give the big idea you talk about principles you know we talk about design urban design principles you know um and then you take it to the next stage you know um and I think maybe that that could be a more effective way. So, and, and then you can get better buy-in from communities in general. It, it's a lengthy process. It can take up to a year potentially, but it's, I think it's worth it. Yeah, you're right. I think it's, um, if it's not an incremental slow building process, then really a public participation going at the end when everything has been finalized and designed and saying, well, this is it kind of accepted or not, doesn't really help. But I think, um, I think let's end the discussion then on that point that you make such a good valid argument that, you know, if you design good quality spaces, it adds a lot of value to our urban lives and you know, just the city. 
Um, and if we go on and build more and get these projects to site and get them realized in reality, then we can actually start maybe possibly changing the perception and the way that we look at things. So that's great. Thank you, Rian. Uh, th thank you so much. And uh, yeah, thanks for everybody who made time to, to come and listen to me. I really appreciate it. Lovely. Well, and we'll see. Can I maybe just say one last thing? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, go ahead. I think so the purpose of these episodes or discussions are very much to find out about how different cities are operating with the same or dealing with the same issues that we have in South Africa. And I think Rian, your presentation was super insightful and it really gave us all things to think about. And also, for example, Malcolm, your question, or if there's others, I think we can continue it on the Facebook page. Um, but then I also think that part of the reason for this series is for people to, you know, if you have practical questions, like how difficult was it for you guys to find work there? Um, I know Craig, you've been there quite a long time. Emma, who's also here, she quite recently moved there and might have very interesting insights to the job market and things like that. So I think we should always try and just chat to each other about these things, even if it's not in the event form, but you know, in other ways like on Facebook or whatever because um, I know it's been very helpful for me as well to find out these things. But yeah, um, thanks so much for everyone for joining. I'm looking forward to the next one. Thanks, thanks for your time, time. Rianne. <laughs> All right. Great night and enjoy the gloomy UK weather. I will do so. <laughs> After the heat wave. <laughs> can, you see the, can you see the sunshine I'm struggling with here? <laughs> it's none the better in Cape Town at the moment, so yeah, it's last case here. <laughs> All right, thanks everyone. Have a lovely evening. Keep in touch with chat soon. Bye.